Eyeballs burning, noses flinch. Lord of mercy, what a stench. Red tide. Where he comes from, no one knows. He just comes and then he goes. Left behind the death he sows. Reminded by each whip that blows. serenade you with some lovely music while we're waiting for everyone to join. That was Sam Brevis by Will McLean. And uh, we'll go ahead and get started. We have all our speakers here. And Matt, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, can folks see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay, great. All right, well, thanks everyone for coming. I uh, appreciate you tuning in. I don't know about the rest of you, but uh, I've kind of reached my limit on this whole quarantine thing, and I sense from others that we're all nearing a, a breaking point. So hopefully the next hour will provide some needed distraction and hope you're all doing well and staying healthy. So today we're going to talk about a large body of work that's been done on Red Tide by Southeast Center, AOML, and many, many partners, um, many folks that I, I have listed here on the title slide. So this is a pretty <clears throat> expansive effort. And we want to look at sort of the way we've tackled this through this Tiger Team approach um, as sort of a way forward for tackling some of our tough ecosystem issues in the region. And we're going to look at the work itself and, and sort of the Tiger Team approach and how that's worked out. So just to start us off, um, for folks maybe who aren't familiar, I think most of you have seen this slide before, but um, just a brief introduction into ecosystem-based fisheries management, why we're doing it, um, why, how we're trying to accomplish it. So this blue schematic here is a uh, schematic of sort of the different levels of complexity of, of single uh, fisheries management. And of course, for many years, we've um, very successfully accomplished single species fisheries management and sort of the status quo and it's been very successful you know, with single species fisheries management. We have um, brought fishing under control so that we, um, for the most part, no longer have overfishing. Stocks have been brought back to the biomasses that are associated with you know, maximum yield over um, the long term. And as we uh, have these successes with the single species management and we have the fishing under control, all the other things besides fishing start to become more important. So things like climate, habitat, um, predator-prey interactions. And so we're seeing sort of increased pressure to um, accommodate management or include all these other sorts of factors in our management. And so when and where it makes sense, 
we are trying to increase complexity um, to account for these different factors and trying to move up this ladder into more um, complex forms of, of fishery management. <clears throat> and so, of course, the issues that we face are very wide ranging and um, diverse. And so we don't have a specific programs or um, sets of people who work on these specific things. The, the issues that we have to tackle are, are varying. And so we've you know, received a lot of our guidance from our leadership um, to be sort of matrixing to be able to tackle these diverse issues. And when I think of matrixing um, across our divisions and functions, this is kind of what comes to mind. I'm not sure exactly what matrixing looks like. I hope it doesn't involve you know, all of us being trapped in this alternative universe where we're being controlled by artificial intelligence or some higher being. Um, but anyways, we're trying to um, you know, get out of our, our cylinders of excellence and trying to matrix across divisions and functions to tackle these emerging issues. And another sort of piece of guidance we've gotten um, in order to make this matrixing work is to form these tiger teams. And so um, we have been forming tiger teams or assembling tiger teams to um, uh, tackle these diverse issues. And I hope everyone's laughing. I guess everyone's on mute, but I'm gonna assume you're all clapping at um, our tiger team figure here. Anyway, so this talk is going to be um, about some of the tiger team work that we've done uh, Center and Beyond has done to tackle the issue of red tide. And um, I will um, be quiet very shortly here, but just give you a quick outline for today. Uh, John Walter is going to talk about you know, how the red tide effort was started and expanded. And then Chris will talk about some of the more recent work um, that we've done to improve and expand monitoring. Susanna will talk about harnessing local ecological knowledge and understanding red tide from a resiliency point of view. Matt's going to go into how we've developed the historical timeline and expanded um, socioeconomic assessments. And then Skylar will bring it back around and talk about how we use all the information to improve our stock assessments. And then at the end, we'll talk about has this entire team approach um, been an effective way to matrix across our divisions and functions to address these emerging issues. So I'm going to be quiet and hand it over to the folks who have done um, you know, most of the work here. And uh, John's going to start us off with how we started and expanded our red tide research. Thanks, Mandy. And I assume I'll let you control the slides. You can move on to the next one. Yeah, and I'm just going to, sorry, um, mute myself. Okay. So I'll kind of get, uh, start with how at least I got involved in Red Tide. And I think it's a kind of a cautionary tale in that one, we often have a lot of blind spots in our what we actually work on or what we see. And part of this Tiger Team approach is that it was really necessary to pull together a diverse group of people and in particular pay attention to what stakeholders were perceiving on the water to be able to fill in those blind spots to begin to address an issue as complex and as systematic and systemic as red tides. And so what happened was we were doing a, what we thought was a simple update of a red grouper assessment. And one of the fishermen said, hey, y'all got to pay attention to what's going out in the water. We were scratching our heads looking at the declines in the indices. And this was for red grouper, same declines occurred for gag grouper where between 2004 and 2005 almost every one of the indices dropped by almost half and we were scratching our heads as to what had happened and one of our, the fishermen said hey there was a major red tide that had occurred and you guys got to pay attention to it now up until that point that wasn't traditionally something that we had dealt with in stock assessments, partly because maybe we hadn't experienced it in the time frame of the assessment, but also there wasn't a routine pathway for incorporation of that information. And next slide. It wasn't, however, though it wasn't well known that there was a red tide in 2005 to a lot of our partners. Clearly, the FWRI had done at that point had very substantial uh, field-based cell count data that had documented it. It was well publicized in the news and our long line survey 
actually also was out in the middle of the red tide. And here you've got on the left the cell count data, and red is cell count of above a million cells per liter, which is a pretty substantial amount of Perennia brevis in the water. And almost the entire area where it was sampled had uh, cell counts that would be indicative of a bloom in that particular time in September 2005. And in the on the right is the NIMS longline survey stations, and red is not coincidentally the red grouper habitat, and that's actually the where red grouper are generally found, and that was the species we were doing this, the assessment of. So I'll just say that from this standpoint of being a stock assessment biologist, I didn't get that the, the message, and that's my fault, but it's also part of the process of where at that time that we were doing an assessment, all we had was an index. Next slide. And that index largely was derived from the long line survey, that being one of the, the most important indices for many of our stocks. And the long line survey, you can see the cruise track here, which is on the left, uh, overlaid on top of a model that I'll get to of the probability of a bloom, showing uh, in August 2005, high probability of a bloom. The cruise track in red happened to be a station that was sampled at night where the vessel went from the western station into that eastern station, remarked with an X, dropped a long line, caught zero, which is pretty typical to not catch anything. There was a low DO, but nothing necessarily in the raw data out of the ordinary other than a zero catch rate. When we looked at the actual cruise log, which doesn't go into the, the quantitative index that gets put into a stock assessment, the ship had actually steamed through three hours of uh, dead fish floating on the surface, and they saw dolphins at this, close to the ship at the haulback, and, and numerous dead fish, including what looked like a 50-pound Warsaw grouper, spotted at the haulback end. So, in fact, they had actually steamed through a, a substantial part of that bloom area but unfortunately what got passed on to the poor analyst which happened to be me was just a low point for the survey without a clear smoking gun as to why next slide so in response to it we actually in the assessment incorporated uh tried to deal with in the assessment but uh realized that we needed to that this was a problem that went beyond simple simply what the fisheries assessment group or uh, our stock assessment group uh, needed advice on. And so we put together what was actually an early tiger team to develop a satellite derived index of red tide probability. And that early team consisted of Brian Linton uh, from, from uh, Southeast Center, uh, Jan Landsberg, Karen Steininger from FWRI, Mary Christman, a statistician from University of Florida, and Rick Stump from NOS, a satellite oceanographer. So it was a truly interdisciplinary team. The goal was to use satellite-derived oceanographic products, develop a uh, statistical model, and then de uh, determine the probability of a bloom event, that model being derived from the cell count data that FWR had routinely collected. Next slide. So that the resulting product was uh, provided probability of a bloom happening, and you can hear our plots of the, the statistical model showing in 2005, which is the major bloom. On the left is August of October, November, December, red being high probability of bloom. The uh, left panel is the average probability, and the right panel on each uh, side is the standard error in that probability. So when you see high probability of bloom in some areas, such as littoral zones, there's also associated with a high standard error, in which case that would mean don't believe it. It's probably a bloom due that appearance of the bloom due to a lot of in the water. So the model is, is any predictions of a model should be also interpreted with the standard error of that prediction. But then on the right is 2010, which was a no bloom year, which showed very low probability of a bloom. So it's saying that the model generally captured bloom, not bloom events. And then when we sum that up in time and space, next slide, it produced an index that we could use in the stock assessments. And so on the left is the satellite-derived red tide index, showing 2005 being the highest by a substantial margin. 
we put that in the stock assessment because what the assessment needs is an index or a time series to be able to then uh, correlate with the other parameters that the model estimates. In this case, a mortality associated with that red tide in that year. And it estimated that about 8 million gag and red grouper died as a result of that bloom event in 2005, which was not an incident that was about 20 to 30 percent of the population. Next slide. So on the basis of that, it led to a substantial body of work by uh, colleagues as well as uh, a lot of uh, work uh, from, from many of our colleagues on evaluating the ecosystem impacts of red tide events, uh, then a substantially uh, well-documented bloom event in 2014 where where the same long line survey was actually to collect a lot more data in a 2014 event, and that was a paper by, by Trey Driggers, and then work to evaluate how management should respond to bloom events in terms of how often should the stock be assessed, what kind of whether there should be more precautionary buffers in the face of these kind of bloom events, and uh, a lot of further work that uh, was is very useful to determine how we should handle these events from a management standpoint. Next slide. And so that brings us to uh, a very, what I think is a really breaking effort, which is to bring in our stakeholders to build what originally were ecosystem models to be able to determine what are the major factors affecting the fishery, what are the major risks in the system, how do changes in the ecosystem affect the businesses and communities, and then what do they value in the ecosystem. And this has been one of our initiatives in the center to be able to better incorporate the human dimensions into our overall EBFM mandate. And so th this was spearheaded by largely by Mandy, and she corralled a group of us to go meet with stakeholders, and Matt facilitated building models, which was actually putting pieces of putting the ecosystem on sticky notes onto a whiteboard and then making the connections. And we did this in three separate places. And at each one of the locations throughout the, the uh, west coast of Florida, the dominant component of the, of the system that was affecting fishermen was red tide. And that emerged as almost a, a I mean, clearly a, a not ignorable factor that was affecting the entire system, not just the fishery, but uh, real estate prices, seafood consumption, and human health. And that it was something that, uh, particularly in the communities that we went to, and that what you'll see later on in the talk was something that uh, really hit us pretty strongly in terms of something that we needed to address further, which, next slide was really the etiology of the Tiger Team approach, which was an organic movement from uh, uh, several of us to say, how are we going to try to build a team that's needed to begin to address this, given the resources that we've got? And I, I will just mention that there's been a substantial amount of work from many, many of our partners and, and collaborators on Red Tides, on HABs, and this is in no way a... I think a, a unique thing that other people haven't tried, but I th what is kind of special about this is how the stakeholder input has been incorporated in both a qualitative and then eventually in a quantitative framework. And I think that's the message that uh, helps us to say we all have blind spots because we're looking either through the lens of a satellite, we're looking through the lens of a stock assessment model, we're looking through the lens of a set of scientific data, but here are the people who are the best integrators of information, that's the human mind, and they're out in the water integrating data over 40, 50 years. And that's the kind of information that I think we need to be able to better incorporate, to be able to build the hypotheses and then design the studies to address a problem that has yet to find a scientific solution. So the team, the Tiger team approach was to uh, document the impacts, to help understand the bloom ecology, and we are no way we're going to understand it better than what uh, many, many other effort has done. We're just going to 
perhaps be able to touch upon what stakeholders understand about it. And then design the studies to be able to better address uh, that from a scientific standpoint. And lastly, because the human element is really the key part of the ecosystem that we can address to try to find ways that we can help build resiliency into the system, find out what has been resilient in the past. So with that, I think I am passing on to the next slide and tagging out with Chris. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much, John. So, um, yes, I'm, for those who know, I'm Chris Kelbel. I'm a research oceanographer over at the Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Laboratory. And um, I've been working on red tides off and on for a little while, uh, probably first starting in grad school, but then with NOAA, starting with integrated ecosystem assessment, one of the first things that Michael Sherpa wanted us to do was to look at how to get red tides in the stock assessments. But in this story, I came in because Mandy and John started doing that participatory modeling effort going over to the West Coast. And I remember uh, Mandy called me shortly after that and mentioned what a bad situation was and was kind of asking what we could do. So one of the other things I have going on is a regular monitoring cruise in, in South Florida. So Mandy, next slide, please. Um, and, and then we talked about changing that, but th that isn't just what the only cruise that's going on. There's other efforts as well. And one of these is the independent surveys that John had mentioned that are led by Matt Campbell out of the Pascagoula lab. And Matt's group in the 2014 red tide really made one of the first observations that showed that there was significant hypoxia occurring as well. So there's these efforts that are going on. Matt was kind of offshore. I was kind of to the south. The, the state red tide data that John was showing you was kind of, is kind of inshore and opportunistic. It really only gets sampled when, when there's a red tide going on. So there were these observational programs going on. But what we really need to do was um, a little bit of reconfiguration of some of them and then a lot of merging of, of the different programs so that they could be used together to really better understand what um, not just what a red tide is, but how it causes these large ecosystem impacts. Because it's not just the, the organism itself killing the fish that, that causes these damages. It, it's secondary effects that happen through hypoxia and other, other processes. So the long line uh, fishery independent surveys that Matt Campbell looks at, they take a lot of hydrologic monitoring, CTDs, and they are a great resource for going back and looking what uh, oceanographic conditions were present during different red tides going all the way back through 2000. So there's a lot of this ancillary data that they were collecting routinely and they were using um, to, to great effect, but not so much looking and seeing what red tide effects were. So we, we took and check, kind of took some of these observational cruises and really kind of didn't really repurpose them because they're still out there doing their primary purpose, but gave them a secondary purpose, which was to, to better understand the oceanography and environmental conditions around red tides. So next slide, Mandy. So as I mentioned, when, when Mandy called me, we really had a cruise going out. I think it was like a month later. And we started looking at what can we do to try and mod modify this cruise to, to better sample the red tide, better get an idea of really what was going on in and around the Charlotte Harbor area, which is kind of at the northern edge of this map uh, on the southwest coast. So uh, we, we quickly were able to secure some funding uh, from both the Southeast Fishery Science Center as well as the uh, have a uh, rapid response uh, opportunity. And in addition to that, we got a bunch of collaborators on board. We had uh, FWC out with us doing video fish surveys. We had Moat doing phytoplankton. We actually brought a commercial fisherman on board to help guide us and, and tell us what he was seeing out there so we could sample the areas that, that he was seeing. And one of the things we observed here uh, was a large hypoxic zone, very, very similar to what was observed in 2014. And what we're starting to think, or what our current hypothesis is, I should say, is that when these red tides are great enough to have really large impacts on fisheries, they're probably often associated with, with significant hypoxia, whether it's duration, magnitude, extent, or all three. So um, when we saw this, there's, um, as I mentioned, there's these other studies going on. So we wanted to get an idea of uh, how common is this actually the fisherman was sitting there at the screen when the first uh, drop in oxygen happened at the bottom. And his first question for me is, is this normal? How often do you see it? Um, and as I mentioned, we modified this survey to go further north than we normally go. So in this area, my answers to him were, we don't know. We don't collect data very often in, in this area. So we need to start doing it more frequently. 
Um, so next slide, Mandy. And, but the other thing is we do have other data collectors that are in the area and around that area. So Brendan Turley, who's just recently started at the, at the Fishery Science Center and, and is working with Mandy and I to try and answer this question, has done an incredible job trying to put together all the various cruises that have been out sampling oceanographic conditions on the West Florida shelf for the past 20 years and really tried to put together first looking at the oxygen patterns to answer that question of how common is hypoxia or even lower oxygen water on the West Florida shelf and is it more intense when there's these devastating red tides and as you can see here what he has found for 2005 and 2014 is that yes there are significant hypoxic events associated with both of those blooms. Interestingly in 2005 you can see the limitations in our sampling design because we're kind of only got the edge of that hypoxic zone. We don't know how far inshore that may have gone. Um, so we are starting to be able to look at some of that historic data and be able to answer, try and come up with the beginning to answer those questions. Next slide, Mandy. And then uh, the other thing we've done is continue to modify these cruises. And we've worked with the uh, state uh, red tides coordinator, uh, Dr. Kate Hubbard, to, to augment these cruises, continue to go further north. The state actually gives us additional funding to continue to sample north. We've also included a bunch of new instrumentation, including an in situ flow cytobot to get phytoplankton community composition on these cruises because we want to understand the possibility of there being a succession type of process where you have a uh, bloom of trichodesmium followed by a bloom of perennia brevis, and also there might be some succession at the end of the bloom that's important for the ecology of this area as well. So we, we, we really modified those cruises, added sampling, added the area, and we're really trying to address the fact that offshore monitoring in this area of red tide is not common and certainly not systematic, and we're trying to make it more so with every cruise. Next slide, please. And then the other thing we've done was that commercial fisherman that was with us is actually in the picture on, on the right there is uh, Casey Streeter, and he was so motivated uh, to, to start and help, help us to be able to answer these questions that he went back to his fishing community and started the Florida Commercial Watermen's Conservation, which is a nonprofit, and they raise funds to actually buy uh, in situ water quality instrumentation that then they take out on the fishing boats and drop over the side and get us temperature, salinity, oxygen, chlorophyll A profiles at regular intervals when they're out there fishing. Um, and this has been another critical way to fill that gap because we can do these cruises, but we're out there at best every other month. Or in this case, you know, with coronavirus, we've been sidelined since January with not going back out until August. Well, these guys are actually out there fishing, so they're out there getting us some samples at least. Um, and it's been a great collaboration, not only to, to get that data, but also to, to work and, and, as John mentioned, learn from, from the fishermen about what they're observing and, and really start to build that into, into our science as well. Uh, next slide, please. And this is kind of what we do. The fishermen are going out collecting the data uh, this has an email in it to us. Actually, now we've got it a little bit more automated where it, when they get back on land, as soon as they connect to Wi-Fi, it automatically loads up to Google Drive where we can then pull the data, process the data. And Brendan and others are really working on a um, program that helps to visualize that data. So next slide, please. And this is showing what, what we tried to do and then send back to the fishermen. This is the online dashboard. So Brendan created this figure from their data so you can see on an offshore onshore transect if you look at the lower left those are the stations that were done here and they're shown by the dash lines and we send back to the fishermen then what we're seeing both in, in all these environmental parameters with a little bit of uh, interpretation provided showing like the strong thermocline with deep colder water some less salty water likely due to freshwater runoff and then at the bottom uh, most important this is dissolved oxygen we're seeing elevated do not decrease DO associated with this bottom layer. So it's not, not a thing for them to be concerned about right now. But it's, it, this allows us to, to collect the data, turn around, process that data, and we're hoping to get it to within a day where we're turning around and sending them back a bulletin so they're aware of what the conditions are in their area. We're really meeting stakeholders' needs on a level that we haven't been able to do so before. And then with that, I'm going to turn it over and uh, let Susanna Blake take over now. And she's going to talk about other ways where we're, we're harnessing the eco ecological knowledge to understand resiliency. Thank you, Chris. 
Um, I forget to unmute myself. Um, yeah, so um, John was mentioning earlier the ecosystem workshops that were conducted in 2018 in, on the coast of Florida to just to understand the elements of the ecosystem um, and how during these workshops, red tides emerge as like key components in the ecosystem. So our team discussed the importance of um, gaining further information and deeper information, uh, broader information on uh, how these red tides impact the local communities and potentially see if we can gather information on uh, the hi any historical information on these red tides from the fishermen. So in November, uh, can you move to the next slide, please? Um, November uh, 2018, um, our data collection process began uh, where we assembled mixed teams of um, scientists made of, of at least one social scientist, at least one fishery scientist. And we went back to the communities affected by the red tides um, to talk to commercial as well as for hire fishermen. Um, we sought to interview particularly those fishermen who had lo a long experience on the water. And um, we conducted oral histories. Our goal during those oral histories was to document red tide locations, frequencies, severity over time and space, document impressions of how red tide blooms develop and their impacts on fish population and habitats, identify ecological signals and stakeholder driven hypotheses, and document community impacts, as I mentioned, and adaptation strategies, potential adaptation strategies employed. The data collection ended this January, early January. Uh, we have a total of 62 interviews collected in eight counties across the coast of, of Florida. Next slide. <clears throat> So a little bit about the interview process and, and how, how the oral history proceeded. So the oral history interviews are used to collect in-depth accounts of personal experience and reflections, in this case, uh, on the red tide. During each interview, we ask interviewers to begin describing their first memory they had of the red tide. And then uh, as they were talking to draw its spatial extent on the map. And as you can see, this is an example of how a map would look at the end of an interview. Um, we would also ask them to describe any memories of how the habitat was affected, species that were affected, what was the, imp the impact on their businesses, their communities, if any adaptation strategies were employed. Um, and we continued this process until the interview, we discussed every red tide they experienced with all these details and uh, if they had any information on red tides from, um, from family members or other fishermen that were not available. Um, some of the red tide accounts go, go as far back as the 1930s. These are usually second uh, hand knowledge though. Um, <clears throat> next slide. So oftentimes, local eco right now, local ecological knowledge is increasingly recognized as valu a valuable source of information, but Sometimes uh, data collected through oral histories or other types of qualitative methodologies are met with skepticism by the scientific community. Uh, however, early on in our data collection, we were very happy to show not only how uh, well it matches data collected through um, the scientific method, but how rich in information this data is, this oral history data is. So interviews often describe changes in the shade of color uh, areas that experience re repeated flare-ups, unusual locations for blooms, changes in fish behavior, and habitat impacts of fine scale. Um, and Matt and Anthony will go uh, more into more detail on how um, the archival information also shows how reliable this data is. Next slide. Um, so the 62 interviews we've collected resulted in approximately 1,000 pages of transcribed interviews. Um, so we're using a qualitative analysis software to analyze this data. We've designed the data analysis framework that um, is meant to respond to all of our um, assessment uh, polls um, as presented here. The analysis is done very systematically for each uh, red tide event. Um, this process is still ongoing. We're 
about halfway through for this analysis. However, we've completed coding for understanding the red tide severity. Um, and we're using this data right now to develop a severity scale, red tide severity scale. Uh, we have three levels right now, minor, major, and devastating. And devastating usually signals an event that had, was exceptional in a spatial and temporal event extent and resulted in massive fish kills. <clears throat> This is a brief example showing how we link now uh, the data obtained from the text analysis to the maps that the fisher that, that the fishermen have completed. This, these are the maps have been digitized at this point. Um, this is an example of events that were identified by fishermen as either major or um, or devastating, and highlighted are the 1972 and 2004-2005 season, which were identified as devastating by the fishermen. And Skylar will, will talk a little bit more of how, how uh, the information from the oral histories can be further used for stock assessment. Next slide. <clears throat> so, but one of the key, um, the key areas that we want to focus our data analysis um, using the oral histories is to understand how we can improve resiliency to red tides. And to do that, we first need to understand what are the factors that affect resiliency and adaptation. And from our pre preliminary research, uh, we found that there are seven key factors that affect adaptation and resilience. And um, oftentimes fishermen talk about regulations that are being uh, overly restricted uh, during this event and prevent them from switching uh, their effort to other fishing areas um, oftentimes. Uh, the effort and cost involved in switching gear to target different species, distance from uh, alternate fishing grounds, increases in trip costs as well as, as trip moves farther from the home port, um, early fishery closures due to effort shifts into alternate species, uh, the media, uh, often has a negative role as it uh, inflates or, or presents the event as being larger or not as accurate as it is and, and leads to um, reduce tourism that in turn affects the charters and the local seafood markets. And uh, lastly, but not, uh, but very important, I, I think, are um, things related to flex, personal flexibilities, um, ability, uh, related to age and health of the fishermen, the level of savings that they have, family support, and the availability to switch into other businesses or the job skills that they possess. Anyway, as I mentioned, this research is still in its early stages and we still have a lot to learn to be able to provide recommendations for improving resiliency, but this is where we are so far. And I will let Matt uh, speak uh, on other research related to our oral history data. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so uh, thanks, Susanna. Uh, my name is Matt McPherson, and I'm an anthropologist, and uh, I work for the Social Science uh, Research Group at the Science Center. I lead the group, and uh, Susanna is also an anthropologist working for our group. Um, and so we've done, a, we've, beyond the uh, the local uh, ecological knowledge uh, work that we've done, which is kind of the core of the socioeconomic work. We've also, you know, done some other things um, to bring socioeconomics uh, into this uh, into this research. And one of the kind of really interesting things that we decided to do is because, you know, just due to age and you know, the age of fishermen and recall issues, we didn't have too many accounts of red tides that really went back, you know, beyond the, probably before the 1990s. And, um, you know, we had a few, but, you know, we kind of wanted to uh, beef up our information about historical red tides. So we decided to do archival research and primarily look at newspaper accounts of red tides, you know, going back into the 1840s. And Anthony Mastiki, Mastiski, who's on this call, did, uh, did all of this work for us. So I want to give him credit for it. Um, he was able, he did a very, very thorough job, and he was able to um, accumulate 
probably uh, somewhere in the vicinity of, I think, 580 articles um, going back to the 1840s. And here, just as we start, you know, playing around with some of this data, you can see, uh, you know, the, uh, the numbers of accounts that we, that we got per decade. And one would think that, you know, this would be biased towards population growth and number of news outlets. But interestingly enough, it seems like the 1950s, the decade of the 1950s was a particularly bad decade for, for fish kills and red tide events, because you can see, um, on the chart here that we got far more accounts for the 1950s than, you know, for, for, um, for other decades. And, uh, you know, the 1960s, on the other hand, we found remarkably few accounts of red tide events. Um, and Anthony did a really thorough job trying to find, you know, trying to find accounts from the 1960s, but uh, he wasn't able to find it. So it seems like the 1960s was relatively uh, low in terms of number of red tides. You know, here again is uh, something, the next, next slide, Mandy, please. And here's again, just, you know, just kind of looking at just the overall numbers um, by, uh, by month, you can see that, you know, the number of uh, newspaper accounts of red tides over time tends to track pretty well with the seasons that we normally, with the months that we normally, um, you know, consider to be high red tide months. And, you know, the highest months here where we find the most accounts are August, September, October, you know, November, and then it starts to drop pretty significantly December and, you know, in, uh, in the winter and spring, you know, there are fewer numbers historically of red tide events or accounts of red tide events. Next slide. We also um, use the, the information in the, arc, in, the, uh, in the newspaper accounts regarding the location of the red tide to, to actually, you know, locate those as points along the coast and to be able to create a geo database of red tide events, historical red tide events. And here's just a couple examples of maps um, that were created using that information. And, you know, you can see that historically, and I think if we made a heat map of, of all of our accounts, you would see that historically, you know, the deep red areas, the darker red areas are those uh, where most red tide seems to to concentrate are sort of in the Charlotte Harbor up to Tampa Bay area. And I think this is probably pretty consistent over time. You can also see that, you know, most of these events are close to the shore and that's probably, that doesn't mean that these events weren't, you know, happening or having an impact farther offshore. It's just that, you know, this is where people were witnessing the, the fish kills, you know, uh, you know, from, from the shore, you know, if for the newspaper articles. And, um, and then you can go to the next slide, please. And then something else we've used this information for is to corroborate some of the LEK information. And Susanna had mentioned, you know, how it's important to kind of triangulate this information to show, you know, that, uh, you know, people's recall is, is uh, somewhat accurate uh, when doing these local ecological knowledge studies. And Anthony found some, he, he's been able to actually use newspaper, the newspaper accounts to corroborate almost all of the severe red tide information that we got, you know, for the earlier red tides, you know, going back into the 60s and 70s. And in this particular case, you can see um, we had uh, a fisherman who, yeah, you know, to the left, you know, he's, he described a red tide that occurred in 1962. Severe red tide that lasted a month. It came all the way up into the river, concentrated in Charlotte Harbor and up to Englewood. Bottom fish stuff, pinfish, catfish, very few mullets and stuff like that. It didn't last long. And here we find an account in the Miami Herald, red tide outbreak mild, seen subsiding in October 1962. Earlier reports of dead fish washing ashore came from Englewood Beach. It's believed the red tide area is limited and the fish carcasses were swept to Lee County shores by stiff northwesterly winds. So it seems like this is probably the red, same red tide event <laughs> that was being described by this fisherman from 1962. Um, next slide, please. And, you know, similarly, 
you know, we have another one, you know, he's a uh, fisherman says everything. And it was deep red, red tide. I mean, the water was crimson, fin fish that were floating. And it's mainly, uh, mainly any species that were floating into all different size, make shapes and all different size. And then the newspaper article, um, you know, describes, and this is from 1970s, early 1970s, I think, you know, the a newspaper article from the same period, a fish killing red tide and bloom along 150 miles of Florida's Gulf Coast for the past month has intensified and the number of dead fish is mounting into the millions. You know, talks about it being in St. Petersburg, it describes the reddish brown waters, um, deep red, you know, like the fisherman said. So anyway, these descriptions match up in terms of time and in terms of description pretty well with what the fishermen were, recall fishermen were recalling. And we've gone back for these, especially for these events that go farther back in time and have been able to match up uh, the majority of the accounts that we got through ecological knowledge with newspaper articles, you know, that are, are probably related to the, to the same red tide events. So it seems like, you know, fishermen, especially recalling severe red tide events that may have had a, an impact on their businesses or their livelihoods or their personal lives, you know, tend to have fairly good recollection of some of these, you know, going into the past. And then a couple other things that we're working on just to sort of, you know, close things out is um, we are working on modeling the socioeconomic impacts of red tide using VMS data. And we're using, you know, looking at fleet behavior to assess change in, in net revenues for the Gulf of Mexico uh, reef fish and coastal migratory commercial fleets during uh, previous red tide events. It's also using VMS allows us to be spatially explicit. And so we're going to look at how the distribution of fishing vessels, you know, changes over time in response to red tide, looking in particular at the, uh, at the two most recent severe red tide events, uh, the 20, uh, 2018, and I think it was uh, 2014. And then we're also going to use this as a way to estimate change in net revenues uh, for fishing, you know, for commercial fishing vessels by comparing their, you know, historical net revenues to, to, to the red tide years and to be able to estimate community level impacts by linking the fleet level red tide economic impacts to uh, social vulnerability indices. And next slide. And then we're also working with T with Texas A and M, um, who received uh, some funding through a grant from AOML as well as uh, they've gotten some money, I think, from some other independent grants. And um, in particular, they're going to focus on the impacts, social and economic impacts of the red the, the 2018 you know, red tide, you know, look at the Charlotte Harbor region and the people and the assets and economic act activities that were at risk from the red tide, look at some of the direct and, and indirect economic losses from the changes uh, in commercial and recreational fishing uh, revenues and effort. And, there, and we're also going to um, provide them with our, you know, local ecological oral history uh, data. And they're going to use that as well as vulnerability indices, the archival research data that we were talking about, and the economic assessments that they do to look, you know, to do a, a sort of a, an assessment of fishing community vulnerability as a result of these red tide events. And I think that's the end of my piece. And so I think, and Skyler is going to talk a little bit about this uh, local ecological knowledge information was integrated into the red grouper stock assessment. CDAR uh, 61. Great. Thanks, Matt. All right. Can, next slide, please. Okay, great. So, yeah, so kind of wrapping up, talking about how all of this work fed into the stock assessment for the Red Grouper. The most recent assessment was being done in about, I think it was it started in 2018. We ended up presenting the final results mid 2019. Uh, so that assessment had a terminal year of 2017. So the last year of data that were provided for the assessment went for, uh, went through 2017. So as you've kind of heard up till now, there was a fairly severe red tide event in 2018 throughout the West Florida Shelf region, but we didn't really know how bad it was. So John provided earlier a pretty good review of kind of how red tide has been incorporated in grouper assessments since the, since the I think, 2009 update for red grouper and as well as gag grouper. 
So on the right here is just to orient you. So this is the projected total biomass from the stock assessment model starting in 1986 through 2017 from the stock assessment. So the data we had, we developed the model, we put in lots of sources, catches, discards, length comps, age comps. And basically the model estimates the amount of removals that would have occurred from red tide in those years with severe events. So 2005 and 2014. 2005 was the event that occurred really off Sarasota and had a really large impact, as well as 2014, which occurred in the Big Bend region. So basically, you know, the way that red tide's been accounted for within the stock assessment for both red grouper and gag grouper is basically just allow for extra, extra natural mortality due to these events in those specific years. So on the left, I'm just giving you an idea. So the there are basically two outcomes of stock assessments. You know, we want to get an idea of current stock status, you know, what's the current status, how is the stock looking. But most importantly, for management, we want catch advice. We want to be able to project what they can catch in a safe manner. So basically, the take home from this assessment was 2017 was the last year of the data we had for the assessment. It From this picture, so just an idea of essentially the stock status, you'd want to be in these green regions above this solid line, which was basically our MSY proxy. We want to be in that good region. So essentially, at the end of 2017, before this red tide hit, the stock, overfishing is not occurring, and the stock is not being overfished, but it was below our target value. So 2017, we're kind of not in a great place. We're not where we want to be. And then we had this, this 2018, red tide, or 2018 red tide hit. Next slide, please. So we were faced with, you know, we could present what we had at that point, but knowing that there likely was probably a big reduction in the stock from that 2018 red tide event, we wanted to at least try to be able to provide some information to the Gulf Council and their statistical and science committee to kind of, you know, be aware of that and be able to incorporate some uncertainty in what we thought was happening. So at the time, you know, we were doing this assessment early 20, 2019, there was not a lot of quantitative data for us to kind of get an idea of what that impact might have been for the stock. And so to kind of give some insight, we used two different sources throughout the assessment. Uh, what Susanna talked about earlier, the local ecological knowledge information. So Mandy had put together a working paper for our assessment, kind of summarizing at the time the primary results. I'll, I'll kind of talk about those in a, a few minutes. We also used a, an online voluntary data collection tool that the council had put out, basically just saying, have you seen anything fishy with Red Grouper in the last few years? And in terms of timing, you know, when this assessment was occurring and this 2018 red tide, it was basically, you know, it was extremely timely and really helpful that we had this kind of information to then go to the management bodies and present this in addition to the assessment results, caveating and telling them, you know, this assessment gives us stock status in 2017. And then we had 2018 and we know that there was likely a very large impact. So here's how we could potentially address that. Next slide, please. Okay, so just to give you an idea, and if anyone's interested, you can go to Mandy's working paper for a lot more details, but, you know, the take home from that analysis was that the 2018 red tide, it essentially was very devastating for lots of fishermen, whereas fishermen in the past said, you know, maybe the red tide was bad for, they were still able to the next year go back to fishing. This event, some fishermen never went back to the fishery. It, it tended to last longer than some of the past red tides. Um, it occurred throughout uh, different regions. You know, there's a lot of information that this kind of compiling. And I know Susanna, they're working on updating this with more interviews. This was kind of midway between that analysis. But it seemed like over time, there was a lot of support for the 2018 red tide being very severe in multiple counties, which is being shown on the left figure. And also for grouper species, as well as other fish species. So one of the important issues with trying to quantify the mortality of red tides is a lot of the information we have comes from the FWRI uh, harmful algal bloom fish count data and oftentimes it's just from species that people see that wash up on shore so it can be very kind of inshore specific whereas we know that there is mortalities that are occurring offshore um, as we've kind of heard in this talk previously with some of the work that Matt Campbell was doing out in that 2014 event. Uh, next slide please. And so how did we end up bringing this into the red grouper stock assessment? Essentially, what we did is we knew that there was a lot of uncertainty in that 2018, and therefore, in our projected population dynamics, we knew that, you know, there could be a range of scenarios depending upon 
how bad that 2018 red tide was because 2018 was the first year of projections, meaning that we don't have data. We kind of have to make assumptions about what's going to happen so that we can then uh, provide recommendations for projected catch advice. And so this figure on the right here is just kind of showing on your y-axis you've got essentially the, the retained catch. So the projected amount of fish in million pounds that could be removed and on the, y, on the x-axis we've got just over time, so through 2035 for projections. So to focus here is basically we ended up developing five different projection scenarios that went over a range of that 2018 red tide impact. So for example, if we had just gone, say, status quo, didn't consider any environmental impacts within the projection period, it would be the red line. So there would have been no red tide mortality. And essentially what that would have said is the, o the OFL would have been set at about 8 million pounds, basically the average of the first five years of production. So the SSC could have recommended an ABC that was well above the current catches, which had really been about 4 million pounds. And so we ended up devising different scenarios so the green line would assume about half of the magnitude of that 2014 red tide event. The orange would have been similar to the 2014 event. The blue would have been similar to the 2005 event. And the black line would have been essentially double 2005, so say a worst case scenario. And just in this figure, for this assessment, our projections basically started, we would start projecting catches in that 2020 value. So you can see that that assumption of how that 2018 a red tide impact of the stock has a really large impact on the catch that would have come out that would have been recommended. And so presenting this information to the SSC, in addition to the local ecological knowledge and other information, their primary job was essentially to say, to make the assumption of how bad do we think that 2018 red tide was compared to the other events that we've seen in our recent history. So say 2005, 2014 because the assessment model had estimated the removals during those years, we did have some way to make some assumptions in terms of what that would have done to the stock. And just for context, for this assessment, the 2005 red tide event killed about 29% of the population, and the 2014 event killed about 21%. So, you know, fairly large removals can have a very big impact. Next slide, please. And so, for, the, for them to also make their decisions, we wanted to emphasize, you know, the uncertainty with this 2018 red tide event by giving them a decision table that essentially goes over each of those scenarios. We projected forward what, you know, the, the population dynamics, what was going to happen within the most recent years based on those different potential removals from that red tide, just to give the SSC an idea of if we're wrong about our assumption, how bad could it be? So. This table is essentially just showing different projection scenarios and the mean catch essentially with each of those. So for example, the OFL in this case, the SSC ultimately went with assuming 2005, uh, similar mortality to 2005. So basically they set their OFL at that catch level, which is about 5.3 million pounds. And then from there, we provided all other scenarios just in case. So for example, if we're wrong about that 2018 red tide, say it's double what we've ever seen on record, there's a high probability that we would have been, that the stock would be uh, undergoing overfishing. But this kind of information at least gives them an idea of what the potential risks could be if they did not include red tide or if they had some understanding of the potential magnitude. And I think that's where the information that's been presented, the stakeholder feedback really, really helped with this analysis. Next slide, please. And then so so in summary, you know, the stakeholder input, I think, was extremely timely for this assessment. Since we presented this assessment in September 2019, we've also gone back in January of this year. Um, Adam Pollack and Pasquagula Lab had updated the NIMS bottom long line survey for us through 2019 for an interim analysis that we're going to try to be doing each year in between full-blown stock assessments. And basically what it shows is it's, it, there, it shows support for our assumption that that 2018 red tide likely had a bit big impact. Relative abundance has been very low in the last few years. And I should also mention that Adam also updated the groundfish survey index, which shows a very similar out, or result. So basically, we're now starting to see supporting evidence that including that 2018 red tide was likely the good way to go for at least for that assessment. Next slide, please. And so for this red tide effort, you know, it, 
we're really in the infancy. There's still so much work that, that this group and everyone really wants to do. I find that every problem you solve, you find 10 more problems. Um, so we all really have our, our work ahead of us. So one of the things that I think Chris mentioned is trying to get more real-time display of conditions for fishermen so that they can, if they're going to go out, they can plan ahead and maybe not go to an area infected by red tides and hypoxia. There's also a lot of work that now all the information has been compiled from the oral histories. There's lots of hypotheses that have been brought up that we're going to be looking into. For example, building the forecast of initiation or termination of severe blooms. I think, you know, hearing a lot of the fishermen, they are spot on with some of their hypotheses in terms of what we're starting to look into. So that's going to be a lot of a big undertaking as well as what Matt presented with trying to develop a historical timeline for red tide research. So we have a lot of understanding since satellite data has come into place, but in terms of going back in time, that's going to be really important if we ever want to try to get a more historical time series to include within stock assessments. And then also, you know, the, the council is extremely interested in how these red tides, not only how they affect red grouper, but how they affect the entire community and how those fishing communities can build resilience to these sorts of events as well as other events. Next slide, please. And so just to kind of summarize how, you know, we had this 2018 red tide event hit and the goals of our tiger team approach basically were number one, to try to get more information on the impacts of the red tide, to number two, understand more of the biology behind the perennial brevis blooms, and to three, to, to really learn what we could and then start preparing because this is likely not the last red tide we're gonna see. And as we started looking at some of the objectives that we could look into for this analysis, a lot of them were either ongoing and we could just augment or add another day of, cert of sampling, but they're also very intertwined. So there's a lot of work that's currently being done and there's a lot of resources that we've been able to, to pump into this work to kind of get at some of these questions, which are really going to be important to help us move forward. And ultimately, you know, we want to improve our fisheries management advice. We want to improve the resilience of the fishing communities. This has been kind of, I think the Red Grouper example shows how almost full circle, how all this information kind of played in. It was just the good, perfect timing for, for incorporation. Next slide. And so just, just kind of wrapping up, yeah, so we had an example application here of a Tiger Team approach where we all kind of came to the table with different skills, different questions we wanted to address. I think one of the strengths that we've discussed as a group with this project is, is oftentimes, you know, not everyone fits in one box, that each person has different experience, different line offices, even different agencies. So the more agencies, the more people that come together through an interdis interdisciplinary approach, the better that uh, what we saw with this project, with better coordination and more funding, we were actually able to address a lot more of the questions that when we first started out with this. Uh, Mandy had led this, spearheaded this, an effort to get more funds from SEFSC, which were very helpful. And that this project really started as a bottom up. So we kind of, a lot of us just wanted to help. We wanted, we saw ways that we could help without, within this red tide environment. And we kind of came together and did what we could. and it's turned into quite a research venture. But some of the challenges with the Tiger Team approach is, you know, nothing else really comes off your plate. You, you still have your normal job duties plus whatever else, whatever effort you want to put into this, depending upon how much, you know, motive, how motivated you are, how much extra potential work you want to do. It can be also be challenging to partner across different offices. And um, I think a lot of us now are getting better with Hangouts, so that's helpful. Uh, another question is, you know, how do we design these teams? Is this something where people come to a question and say they want to get involved, or is this kind of a recommendation from your supervisors telling you that you need to work on certain things to achieve the strategic missions? Um, and then lastly, you know, with, with EBFM comes greater, you know, greater needs, greater desires, and it's just the more that we have to do to respond to EBFM, it's it's going to be challenging to balance the, what we're currently doing and, and be able to continue contributing. So I think, Mandy, that might be it. So yeah, with that, I mean, this work has been just a big effort from lots of different agencies, lots of folks have contributed, and this wouldn't have been possible without everyone from, you know, the IEA project or program back a couple of years ago when I was a postdoc through to the more recent efforts. And hopefully this is just the start of a, a big program. And with that, we'll take questions. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to all the speakers. That was excellent.
Um, so we're just at the hour, so folks have to hop off, no problem, but I'm, I'm happy to stay on um, if there's any questions for, for anyone in particular for the group. I will stop presenting. You can type them in the chat box too. All right, I guess people have uh, three o'clock commitments or they are uh, ready to go back to their lives of balancing everything and quarantine and staying sane. Thank you, David Birgamit. <clears throat> Joe Serafi here with a question. <clears throat> go for it. You guys obviously have talked about impacts, but for those of us who are pretty ignorant, what are the causes and has there been substantial improvement in, in real prediction? Um, I'm sure nutrients have something to do with this. Is it, is it upwelling? Is it freshwater flow? What's, what's the state of the art um, when it comes to the actual processes? Yeah. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, it's good. Um, so there, we're getting better, I'd say, at understanding the mechanisms and the causes. That a lot of it points to, to nutrients and upwelling at the initiation point, especially upwelling favorable winds. Um, so, so I think I think the latest I would say that the, the latest I thought is that it's it's winds, it's position of the loop current in the initiation phase, and then the kind of maintenance and succession are less well defined and less, there's tons of theories there, and that's where potentially river runoff might come in as well. But that still is an area of active research. There's been no kind of consensus on that. Thanks. And as Don mentioned earlier, I was going to add to that, um, you know, there's a lot of people and experts who've been working on this for a long time. And you know, obviously, there's a lot of work to be done. And so part of our effort, I think, is just getting all the information, um, particularly you know, stakeholder viewpoints and getting that out there as a resource. So, you know, all the LEK interviews are available to the public um, through the oral histories and the database that Susanna talked about. Um, it's also going to be public. So part of our goal is just to get as much information out there so that, you know, other researchers in the community can also build on that to try and find answers to these problems. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add, I think we all come from a bias of the vantage point we can look at the problem. And we have to be aware that we only, that that vantage point might be, in my case, my desk. And my computer for other people it's also that and other people see things on the water but they're only on the water in the area that they fish and it's acknowledging though the biases of each individual vantage point and putting them together into a, a larger summation where i think we're going to be able to build and develop better hypotheses to test and I think it's it has been informative for us that fishermen really are seeing things that that maybe we didn't see before looking at data sets that the data sets were missing that area and so we wouldn't have seen it in the data. And I think that's where we can probably chip away at some of the mechanisms in a product in a, and make progress that we hadn't been able to make before, uh, mainly just because we were there are vantage point didn't allow that. So I guess maybe for the Tiger team in total or Mandy specifically, I don't know. So have the fishermen given uh, an idea of how they might use some of the products we've been talking about rolling out to them? I mean, is it is it long-term planning or is it avoidance of errors and, and, and shifting effort or what do they um, see with the 
Yeah, I, I don't know, Brendan, if you're on, if, if Brendan's on, he's the one who's currently been working um, with the fishermen most, or I can try and answer, um, but I'll give Brendan the opportunity. Yeah, I'm here. Um, so, specifically with, like, uh, the data they're collecting and then we're processing and sending them back out to them, I think, I think the major advantage would be for them to reallocate their effort and either decide not to invest heavily in, in fishing certain areas that might be of concern. So that way they save a lot of money, quite frankly. And I think, um, I mean, Manny can speak to this more, but there was one year, it was 2005, where the, the, the stone crab fishery took a huge hit because they prepared all these traps. They went out and set them out, and they, it was just devastating. They basically had no real... Yeah, that, no problem. They took a huge hit, so yeah. it's probably the best way. Yeah, so that's that's one of the things I didn't mention about how we changed the cruises too is that timing of them. So the cruise I showed from October two thousand eighteen, we were out there as the stone crab season opened, and I think part of the reason all of us got so involved in this is that when you hear just the heartbreaking stories from these fishermen that have invested so much money and then they put their stone crab traps out and they catch seven pounds and their whole livelihood's gone. Uh, and, and and that's part of it. So now we, we our timing we altered. We don't do that cruise in October when the stone crab season's opening anymore. We do it the month before to get them information about what the bottom oxygen is looking like in the areas that they're that they're likely to be fishing. Um, so that, that's one way that for sure that, that we tend to help them, and I think that's a real tangible way that, that it can provide a benefit right away. Yeah. And it, we're kind of in the conversations with them right now, but they talk about when these upwellings occur or whatever it is that makes the bottom oxygen um, not necessarily hypoxic, but start to go around like three or four milligrams per liter. They say that there's changes in grouper behavior. And so, you know, it might not be just red tide, but there's other sort of physical um, properties of the water that they might might be useful to them in their fishing operations. So. Yeah. Okay. so a typed question. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, Ian. Ian says, I see the fisheries focus of the West Coast, but have you looked at events in the East Coast of Florida as well to inform in the initiation or maintenance of blooms? I might add to that too, Mandy. So, yeah. the, you know, like there's also the like hypoxia events or the, the major flood events coming down the Mississippi that really impacted Louisiana and Mississippi last year. So is there also concurrent sort of discussions going on more broadly across the Gulf? Um, not yet. Next year. We'll do that next year. Um, or did I, did I just involve, <laughs> did I just volunteer? Okay. You're my son. Yeah, <laughs> you, yeah, you just walked into well the conversation that we need to have about what and how all future tiger teams address problems that are interdisciplinary. Yeah, I think you and just volunteered to lead the next tiger team. Maybe being now the uh, branch chief, you could be the, uh, the the take on that tiger team tasking development. Uh, great, op great let, leadership yeah. opportunity. Yep. We'll let Clay and Lisa know. Yep. Um, so to answer Ian's question, we haven't focused on the East Coast. Um, I mean, we didn't do any interviews over there. We did speak to, to fishermen on the East Coast as well as in the Keys. They kind of said, oh, it's, yeah, you know, we see it every now and then, but it just comes around from the West Coast. Um, so it didn't seem like a big enough deal for us to, um, you know, commit the resources to expand to those areas. We we did go out to Panhandle though, we did cover that area, Panhandle Florida. And and from the archival accounts, you know, we do have we do have the information, you know, of the uh, events that you know were identified on the on the East Coast as well as down into the Keys, and I didn't. Point those out. I was actually going to point those out in the maps and the, in the presentation, as opposed to just focus on that West Coast area we've been working at. But yeah, you can see that. You know, there are accounts, but they're relatively rare in comparison to the ones on the on the West Coast. It's something that we should, in the future, perhaps 
take a closer look at. No. Any other questions? You feel very free to email us later too. All right. Well, I don't see anything else coming in, so um, I guess we can end it there. Thanks, everyone. It was great to see you all. Thanks for your interest, and um, yeah, let's keep the discussions going regarding the the Tiger team approach. You know, figure out what this means and how we're going to address these issues. Thanks to again Thanks, to the speaker. Have a good one. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.